because I was born in Italy and started school in Italy, it was always uh, a self-evidence for me that uh, if I ever went to university, it would be the humanities, because the humanities are the core of the university and vice versa. And uh, there was never any question that there would be alternatives. I always loved philosophy because in Italy we uh, are taught philosophy from an early age. Loved literature as well and loved books. So there was never a moment of hesitation. Because I then migrated to Australia and halfway through my uh, sort of early school days really, I experienced the uh, Anglo-Saxon system. Uh, where there's a number of different factors, um, much more interdisciplinarity, much more fluidity between the disciplines. And by the time I got to university in Australia, I hesitated a little bit, and philosophy still remained my big passion, but I thought maybe I should do law, which retrospectively would have fitted in better with my uh, in, uh, interest in power relations and normativity, etc. But I stayed loyal to my first loves, and I did philosophy and literature, and hesitated between two for a long time, did a, an honours degree in each, and ultimately opted uh, for philosophy. Uh, the faculty that I enrolled in uh, at the time uh, was called uh, the Faculty of Arts in a school of general studies, which was the way in which they uh, sort of defined undergraduate uh, uh, curricula. Uh, now, one of the things that attracted me uh, to the humanities in the way that it was being taught in the Commonwealth the British education system is that it had built in a great sense of connection to the community. Um, it was really about service um, and it was not uncommon for everybody uh, after classes to do some sort of volunteer work. I checked this with my colleagues in the Ivy Leagues of the United States recently and discovered that it is still the case that, for instance, for admission to a place like Harvard, high scores, of course, are absolutely necessary, but also hundreds of hours of community service, of volunteer work. It is still the case that that is one of the qualifying elements for admission to the big schools. So that sense of a connection between university, particularly the humanities and humanity, the, the real people out there, was completely crucial and attracted me to the field. Because I went to university in the early 1970s, of course I was in the middle of the Cultural Revolution. I mean, Germaine Greer was the hero of Australian feminists when I was a kid, still is. Um, so this, the, this sense of service doubled up in the form of uh, activism and being a militant in groups outside the university. So that was an incredibly important part of my uh, undergraduate training. My feminist groups, um, the peace movement, these were the years of the Vietnam, and anti-Vietnam war moratorium. Uh, migrant work, I taught Italian to children of migrants because I wanted them to keep their identity and not become completely assimilated into the system. The 1970s in Australia were not an easy time for southern European immigrants and it became trendy later in the 1980s, multiculturalism pitches in, but Australia had a white Australia policy way into um, the late 60s until I think uh, 70, 71. So it was a period where the race issue was very pervading as it remains, I believe, in Australian life uh, with the indigenous population even today. So being active in, and living through the times was very much part of what uh, the education in the humanities made possible for us. And I remember reading the great literary text, also classics, and the, the great classics and the history of philosophy, and finding inspirations for the big questions that had always haunted me. Now, what is justice? And uh, why do we have such discrepancy between the rich and the poor? Uh, how can we achieve um, peace? Um, uh, why are men in charge of everything? Just the big questions that seem you know, naive, but what is the strength of the humanities is that they give dignity and intellectual robustness to those questions. So that was for my undergraduate years. The PhD years in Paris, um, uh, late 70s, uh, early uh, 80s, were all about the political and politics. And, uh, it was an incredible time of transformations. It was, it was uh, the Iranian Revolution of 79, the beginning of the end 
of communism um, with the publication of the Gulag Archipelago in French, again in 78, 79. Times were definitely changing and my years in Paris were made of long hours in the library and many, many hours in my feminist collectives. And, and because it was Paris, it was feminist collectives that also were intellectual groups. So we published magazines and newspaper articles and made a lot of intellectual things happening. And so that, that was a period of translation theory, practice, practice theory which for me was supplemented by seven years of psychoanalysis that made the reflection about the roots of my motivation. I, why do I care for justice? Why is freedom so important for me? Uh, that self-reflection was very much part of my training. So what again, the flexibility of a discipline like philosophy practiced with the teachers that I had then, Foucault, Irigere, Deleuze, flexibility of a discipline that really wants to be part of the world. And, and my teachers uh, completely in Paris taught us that philosophy belongs outside in the world and we mustn't just think inside, you know, in an inward manner. The, the philosophy and the humanities are accountable to the world that they are trying to comprehend. That has remained absolutely crucial to my practice. Having been the founding uh, director of the Women's Studies program here, I was really able to focus on issues of gender equality, but feminist politics and uh, patriarchal power, violence against women. I was able to make that very much part of my work, but always with my philosophical training. So the question of political subjectivity and ethical subjectivity and not a victimology, but how can the oppressed still make a contribution to knowledge and society as well as um, trying to survive in very disadvantageous uh, situations. So that was um, very much part of, of my intellectual horizon and I was um, able to run that program uh, for 17 years and, uh, and consequently develop a whole curriculum, BA, MA, PhD, that explore different facets of the status of women and uh, gay and uh, bisexual and transsexual people. Um, uh, an incredible opportunity and I will never be able to thank Utrecht University enough for entrusting a 30 year old with such a responsibility. After about 17 years of this, um, uh, I uh, had a second chance in uh, uh, being able to set up the Center for the Humanities where the focus on the relevance of the uh, humanities in the world today can be a lot sharper um, uh, because that's our raison d'etre. I should say also that the transition between the responsibility for a fully constituted curriculum uh, to a center for the humanities is an emancipation of sorts in the sense that when I was in charge of a whole curriculum and the destiny of so many students, I was a little bit more cautious with my politics, although my critics wouldn't say that, I'm sure, but I was being a lot more cautious about my politics insofar as I had serious institutional responsibilities in terms of pastoral care and career management of these young minds. So I was careful, for instance, even in advertising my very, very happy relationship um, with my uh, female partner, just be careful with things, not in any way you know, hiding, but not pushing too, much, too many issues, not to rock the boat because you're carrying a very heavy bureaucratic structure. And in all the years of my um, being responsible for the Women's Studies program, I kept my philosophical work partly to the side, also because um, Deleuze studies uh, throughout the 80s wasn't particularly popular. Nobody was doing really nomadic theory, uh, very little a very few people on the margins. When I finally moved to the Center, for, when I created the Center for the Humanities, on the other hand, I was able to put at the center my philosophical interests. By then, uh, Gilles Deleuze was a household name, everybody was doing some sort of nomadism, so that gave me a lot more intellectual freedom. And because the Center for the Humanities does not have a teaching program, I also can run risks um, uh, because I'm not putting my students' lives at risk, so to speak. And so that freedom I cherish. Uh, and uh, it allows me to explore new critical axes between the humanities and the world, um, uh, which also allows me to go back to the big questions that I used to ask as a kid. What is justice? And what are we here for? What can we do to transfer a sustainable world to future generations? I've seen a few institutional changes in all these years, and the faculty that I work in now 
uh, is called the humanities and the faculty that I came into over 20 years ago was called the faculty of letters. We've seen a few mergers, I'm sure we will see a few more before I'm out. Um, I'm not sure that they're all for the better, but student enrollments are up and running, so I remain upbeat about our future chances of survival. I would like to continue exploring the interfaces between philosophy and the outside of the academic institution. In this respect, the Center for the Humanities is really the perfect navigational tool. We are exploring, and I would like to continue that, um, what we call the environmental humanities, which is not just uh, eco-criticism or human rights, um, uh, but really the contribution that culture, representation, language, media can make to both the perception of the problem and uh, changing people's attitude to the issue of um, planetary survival. Uh, what is strong for me uh, in uh, the humanities in the 21st century, also in the light of the last book I wrote, which is called The Posthuman, is that it implies a shift from the centrality of man as, as male, but also man as anthropos, to pers different uh, perspectives that would have at the center, for instance, the Earth, so geocentric perspectives, or the future of the entire species, so um, very global cosmopolitan perspectives, um, and our responsibility for non-human others. Um, also connected to this, an increasing concern I have for the peculiar forms of inhumanity that our era is uh, an era that I call uh, posthuman, um, but people call it also the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene, if you want to call it with Donna Haraway. This strange era that we are uh, in, the forms of violence and cruelty and horror that we're also experiencing. So try to be very accountable working in interdisciplinary teams with researchers, artists and activists, policy makers, trying to bring the humanities out, in a sense of their history, into the real world. Another one that I really am totally fascinated by is the intersection between brain research, the new neural sciences, culture, language and representation. If we have extended minds then, if it's not about one individual but about networks of connections, what does that mean for the practice of the humanities and uh, where can we go with this? I think we're living through an incredible era of uh, scientific uh, revolution and scientific changes. Um, uh, science and technology are really altering so much the perception of matter, of ourselves, of where we're going. I would love the humanities to join in in this. And even if it sounds like we have to follow science, this is not what I mean. We should make alliances and, 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 and be able to express our own contributions to this new world that is being um, sort of mutating under our eyes. And if I could, this uh, faculty would be called the post-humanities, not in any sort of sense of decline, but in the sense that of going beyond the classical humanism that has sustained the humanities uh, until today. Uh, the humanities for a world that is redefining its traditional boundaries. And so the humanities is an exercise in, in creativity as well as in critique. So once again, I am back to my big questions, my first love.